All right, well, good Sabbath and welcome to the Phoenix Seventh-day Baptist Church. Now a member church in the Seventh-day Baptist Conference of the USA and Canada. This, this is what they gave us a week ago this afternoon. I mean, you can all look at it, of course, but for the sake of anybody else who, who might be listening, it says Phoenix SDB Church was welcomed into membership with the network of churches known as the SDB General Conference USA and Canada following an affirmative vote by delegates during Conference Week 2024. There we are. We'll have to find an appropriate place for that. Actually, two churches were welcomed into uh, conference membership this year, and interesting that Dave Stahl was involved in, in both of them. Uh, he is pastor of the other church that was welcomed into membership. There's one thing before we pray, uh, excuse me, uh, just to make sure we all know, we, we finally switched our business meeting, which some, some churches would call the July business meeting, right? Well, we didn't do that, so rather than August 11th, we're going to have it tomorrow afternoon, August 4th. Uh, there's some there's some big things happening soon, and so we all need to pray and and be there online, of course. All right, let's pray now. Father, we praise you for this Sabbath day. Lord, even, I mean, even among the few of us, we have put a lot of miles on the road and in the air this summer. And as some of us have learned, car accidents can happen. So among many other things to be grateful for, we just thank you for the safe travel that we've had and for bringing us together again this Sabbath to worship you and to build each other up in the faith. Fill us with your spirit and make these things happen today, we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's sing. Good morning, everybody. Today, our scripture reading is 1 Corinthians 1, 26 through 29. Mm -hmm. Or consider your calling, brethren, that there were not many wise according to the flesh, not many mighty, not many noble, God has chosen the foolish things of the world to shame the wise, and God has chosen the weak things of the world to shame the things which are strong, and the base things of the world and the despised God has chosen, the things that are not, so that he may nullify the things that are, so that no man may boast before God. Our heads in prayer. Dear Lord, I thank you for this day. I pray that you would be with us, join us today. Let us hear the things you want us to hear and see the things you want us to see. I thank you for bringing us together. And I pray that you would be with those who couldn't be here today. In Jesus' name I pray. Right. Um, what a pencil today. I'm going to start by taking a little survey. I want to know who we have in our congregation today. Just just raise your hand if if this is you. I'm just gonna ask ask a few questions. First, how many movie stars do we have here today? How many 
U.S. senators or representatives? How many millionaires or at least people with six or seven figure income? How many professional athletes? Is there anyone here who has won a beauty contest? Finally, how many kings or queens have come to worship with us today? Okay, let me add this up. That's what I thought. The total is zero. One more question. How many Christians do we have here tonight? Right. That doesn't surprise me either. If somebody took a survey like that in all of the local churches of the world, most of those surveys would have the same result we did. Most of the people in most churches are not the, you know, hot shots, big deal celebrities. What do they call them? Movers and shakers. Most of us are just ordinary folks. And in many churches, even a fair percentage of what you could call down and outers. Now, why is this? It's because of the scripture that was read earlier, 1 Corinthians 1, 26 to 29. Now, we might wonder, how did Paul know this about the Christians in Corinth and about Christians in some other places? As far as I know, he never took a survey like the one I did. He didn't have to because he had been there. Corinth. He had been to Corinth, met people that he was now writing to. In fact, he was the one who had first told many of them about Jesus in the first place, started the church there. And Paul had been lots of other places too, met lots of people, saw many people come to Christ, started a few churches. So I'm guessing here, but I wonder if, as he wrote this letter, I wonder if he had actual names and faces in mind, people in Corinth that he could remember. You know, maybe some former slaveholders, <laughs> maybe tax collector or two, sick people, some of them lepers. Jews, who everybody called dogs, uh, and of course, slaves, usually lots of slaves. What we read here in 1 Corinthians 1 is a summary of the kinds of people that Paul had met, people who had heard him preach Christ crucified, as he said earlier in verse 23. Well, after a few years of this, it wasn't hard to see a pattern. Not many movie stars, not many athletes, millionaires, beauty contest winners, kings or queens. Not many of them accepted the message of the gospel. Maybe one or two here and there, but not usually. Remember once when, when Paul did share his faith with the king? Now, later on, in the part that we're not told at the end of the book of Acts, he may have actually talked to Emperor Nero. But he doesn't say that in so many words. But earlier, he did share his faith with a king. What was his name? Anyone know? Agrippa. 
This is this story is in Acts 25 and 26. Now we won't read it now, but let me just summarize the story. King Agrippa actually made time in his busy schedule and gave Paul permission to speak. So Paul told him the story of his conversion, and he talked about Jesus being crucified, raised from the dead. He even said, I testify to small and great alike, meaning not physically small, but we would say lesser people and greater people. And of course, Agrippa was one of the great people. So what did the great King Agrippa think, of, think about Paul's gospel? He said, I quote, you almost persuade me. And at the end of this, uh, uh, of that interview, the all, his, King Agrippa's only reaction was to comment on Paul's legal status. He said, this man could have been set free if he hadn't appealed to Caesar. King Agrippa heard the gospel. He had his chance. We would say he blew it, like many other great people after him. As far as I know, the first king to become a Christian was Emperor Constantine, some 300 years after this. But there haven't been very many like that. Not many noble not many influential people. Now, in all fairness, there actually are quite a few professional athletes who are Christians. And I find it interesting that uh, many of them have been football players. I'm going back a ways now, but I can remember people like uh, Mike Singletary. Chicago Bears, Roger Staubach, Dallas Cowboys, Napoleon Kaufman, Oakland Raiders, back when they were Oakland Raiders. All Christians. Can anyone name any more? Anyone know any professional, well known athletes who are Christians? Who? Yes, his career was short. Anyway, lots of Christians among athletes, but I'm pretty sure there are a lot more Christians in prisons and a lot more Christians doing just ordinary jobs or maybe no jobs at all, never making the papers, not known by very many people. Here in 1 Corinthians, Paul described these people with words like foolish, weak, lowly, despised. If I took another survey and asked, how many foolish people do we have here today? How many weak, <laughs> how many lowly, how many despised? May, would anybody raise their hands? Well, one. You know, maybe there are other words. Maybe there are some better words to describe some of us. You know, ordinary, hurting, untalented, struggling. I think maybe we have some of those kinds of people here. And you can bet there are plenty of them out there. Hungry for some good news. So, for lack of a better term, I'm calling these people the out crowd. You've heard of the in crowd? Of course you have. You've heard of them because they're famous, they're glamorous. They get their picture taken a lot. Some of them even have photographers and reporters following them around everywhere they go. 
when did reporters and photographers ever follow you around? You know, the gospel of Christ should be good news to the in crowd because God loves them too and wants to save them. Mostly throughout history, it's been out crowd types who find the good news to really be good news. Why do you suppose that is? I think it goes something like this. When you already have everything, you don't think you need anything else unless it's more of what you already have. You're self-sufficient, or you think you are. So what is Jesus going to give you that you don't already have? But when you can see that you have next to nothing, and your situation is desperate, then you are better able to see your need. There are probably a million different reasons for why people come to Christ, and all of them come down to mainly one thing, seeing a need in yourself and realizing that only Jesus can meet that need. Well, some people have physical problems that really give them a hard time and show them, you know, how how needy they they are. Some people have lost everything. Their health, their family, their work. Or it can be emotional problems or relationships that are all fouled up. The classic picture of the down and outer is a drunk who has lost everything, lying passed out in a gutter in the skid row section of a large city. Now, I had heard of that kind of thing for all my life. But I also remember one time years ago when I saw someone literally lying, passed out in a gutter. It was not a pretty sight. There are some really needy people out there. As, as tragic as those things are, all of them are basically symptoms. The real need is spiritual. And it's the same for everybody, in crowd and out crowd. Everybody is a sinner and needs Jesus and his salvation. Without him, we're lost. With him, we have eternal life and we have hope. The way it works for most people is that we have to have some symptoms to get our attention and help us realize that, that we need something outside of ourselves. People who have everything usually don't see the need. The down and outers, hurting people, are more likely to see the need. Like a man I read about once who had leprosy. Leprosy can be a horrible disease. Yet this man, this is like 50, 60 years ago maybe, this man eventually came to the point where he could actually say, I am grateful to God that I have leprosy. If I didn't have this disease, I would never have come to this Christian doctor who not only treated my physical disease, but also brought me to Jesus. That was an actual man that I read about in a book about this doctor. He was a missionary doctor. His name was Paul Brand, who worked with lepers in, in India for many years. And no matter what the symptom is, 
that's how it usually works. Seeing the need and accepting the Lord. As Paul said here, not very often among the in crowd, not many of them humble themselves enough to, to bow down before God and admit their need. When it happens at all, it's mostly the out crowd. People, or at least it's, you know, people who are, shall we say, closer to the out crowd than the in crowd. And for those who have ears to hear, it ought to be very good news that God loves hurting people and he wants to meet their need and accept them into his family. Excuse me. may be wrong, but I think we have some hurting people here. And where would we be without Jesus? You know, somehow it makes sense that Jesus should love the people who are lowly, uh, despised, and rejected. People with no beauty or majesty, unattractive. Does that sound familiar? Isaiah 53 uses those very words to describe Jesus. You know, acceptance and tolerance are big stuff today. <laughs> Many churches say, we accept anyone. Everyone is welcome here. And that sounds good. You do have to be careful. There are churches that will say, Jesus accepted everyone, all kinds of people, and so do we. That's right. But that's only half right. They fail to mention that after Jesus accepted sinners, he changed them. It's not right to accept people who practice sinful lifestyles, but don't expect any change or repentance. They might as well say, any behavior is okay, and any theology or no theology is okay. I actually saw a newspaper advertisement once for a church that, that said BYOF. Bring your own faith. In other words, anything goes. You can believe anything you want. That's not good news. The good news is that God loves everybody, but when we accept him, he won't be finished with us until we're holy, like Jesus. And it's usually the out crowd, the hurting people who fit in the kingdom of God. You know, sometimes when I have been with, with in, in a crowd of other Christians, you know, whether it's a small crowd or a large crowd, or, but it's a big crowd. I was in a crowd of 86,000 people once back in the 70s. Um, but especially when it's people that I've never met before. Uh, sometimes I sit there and, and I, or stand there, and look around at these people. And it almost always reminds me of this scripture in 1 Corinthians 1. I look at the people and I think, sure enough, another group of Christians, another typical bunch of believers, not many noble, not many with human wisdom, not many influential, not the big deal in crowd, a bunch of ordinary folks. And then I think, praise God, 
for the good news that he loves even us. Let's thank him for that now. Father God, we do praise you for the love that you had for the world. And we understand there that world you're talking about is the people. Now they're all people, high and low, rich and poor. And, uh, Father, so many other, so much variety, so many people you've made love. So Father, thank you that even we gathered here today are included in that number. Help us to reach out and to find some others. We ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's close with another song.